<laughs> yeah, the Canadian one. Um, yeah, that's a really cool doc. It's kind of like partially animated or something. I've set that's my neat. computer to block all Canadian multimedia. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too earnest for you. Well, I don't want the Quebecois to get to me. <sighs> But Quebecois is so fun to say. It is, I know. Yeah. That's part of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. I'm your host, Sean Hartman, road manager for Peter Cook's favorite Pentangle and Weezer cover band, Once I Had a Sweater. (laughs) That is my favorite of of the many that are out there. Yeah. Oh, dear. I'm co-host Jeremy. Guys, economic times have been tough here at the the Ruggles household. Oh, oh man, no. are you having supply chain issues? <laughs> I'm having some finance issues. I had to have the electricity shut down. And I'm so I'm just it's tough out here, right? And this guy shows up at my door and he's offering me a job. It's good money, right? He's dressed kind of funny, but he's got a job for me in Harveysburg, Ohio. (laughs) And I'm going to be selling uh, turkey legs and meat pies for him. He said it's it's a fun atmosphere. There's going to be, you know, people playing with swords and dancing around and some fashion shows. So I'm pretty hyped on it. I think this might be the way out. Jeremy, I, I hate to break it to you. It's I think that you're going to be working at a Ren Fair. No! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, how will you survive? <laughs> I I don't think he did <laughs> just now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. Well, do it, we have a co-host to replace him? Maybe. Maybe. If Jeremy gets back up off the ground here, I'm going to offer him a job at my new venture instead, which I'm co-host Peter Cook, and I'm excited to announce that I'm opening my new Pentangle-themed restaurant, Springtime Promises. Our menu will include the basket of light chips, the (laughs) sally-go-round the roast beef, and the cuckoo cocktail. But save room for our desserts, because we know that once you had a sweet tooth. Sean, did you help him with that? That sounds like a Sean one. I think I was the inspiration. I did channel Sean for for this one. Well done. Yeah, well, I can't wait to visit. When is the grand opening? Uh, On June 18th. Perfect. Just in time for spring. It's springtime promises, and there will be like three days of spring left. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) And joining us on I'd Buy That for a Dollar for this episode is a returning guest who is a music supervisor, a DJ, and a music fanatic. Welcome back to the program, Taylor Rowley. Hello. Um, Yes, my name is Taylor Rowley, and I let no man steal my time, nor my parsley, sage, or rosemary, for that matter. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, they spell it just like that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. T-H-Y-M-E. Well, there's a lot of, uh, we have a lot of allusions to some traditional folk songs going on here and and ren fairs and all that why could that be taylor any ideas are you asking me that question (laughs) (laughs) i just kind of put it on the table for anyone Uh, i mean i can answer on on the round table (laughs) yeah exactly is it because we are going to discuss a pentangle record yes the pentangle and the pentangle album to end all pentangle albums which is Basket of Light from 1969, their third album. This is a, another one in our series of uh, Jeremy's favorite style of music. <laughs> <laughs> Me, 
medieval folk rock. But it's not. He, he can't get enough of it. <laughs> it's not really. They wouldn't. Pentangle would not like us calling it folk rock. They they might settle for folk jazz, maybe. But yeah. Yeah, and th- this came out on the Transatlantic label in the UK and Reprise in the US. It did reach number five on the UK album charts in early 1970, thanks to the lead song on the album, which I believe was the first song we were going to feature. Right, Taylor. Yes, uh, that song is called Light Flight. Yeah, side A, track one, with lead vocals by Pentangle member Jackie McShee. Let's get into it right now. a lovely traditional math rock song (laughs) there are some odd time signatures in there yeah it switches between five eight seven eight and six four i I couldn't tell what the signatures were but i could tell they were strange ones and i was like oh yeah yeah i think that's what kind of sets them apart from a lot of other acts or in this genre yeah the, the jazz element of this band is what really made this album stand out to me when I was getting into a lot of this British folk music uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Plus, Jackie McShee, just, she has a voice that I've seen described as placid or ethereal, and she multi-tracks her voice on that song, which I think is a another standout element of it, since uh, normally it's a lot of the members harmonizing. Yeah, there was kind of a... I guess for my frame of reference, like maybe early Jefferson airplane-ness to some of it that made it uh, more tolerable for me. (laughs) In the the grand scheme of uh, medieval folk rock or Ren (laughs) Fair. Yeah, I'm I'm an Anglophobe, I think is probably the right (laughs) word. Anglo-averse. Yeah, Anglo-averse perhaps. We've... We've Jeremy has you know used the uh, derisive term Ren Fair music and, and Sean as well for this and I've just I've just adapted it to you know I, I've uh, reclaimed it here, but Taylor you've uh, in conversations you've called it Maypole <laughs> you've you've called some of the stuff that gets too into that traditional folk vein Maypole music yeah it's like Maypole music it's like you know and this is Spinal Tap when they're dancing around the Stonehenge and. Yeah, it's like that kind of thing. It's some of this stuff gets a little Wicker Man. You know that, what I mean? That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> like, this is the music that's in Wicker Man. 
And I don't like totally hate that, but I'm, it does give me a little bit, uh, I don't know. It's, it's go, a little goes a long way, but I think that this album is a lot different than than that. And that song, it was a, a hit song in the UK because it was used as the theme song. I think it was a different recording of it, but it was used as the theme song for the BBC drama Take Three Girls, which was about three young women sharing a flat in swinging London. And that aired from mm-hmm. 1969 to 1971, the first BBC drama broadcast in color. So that's what helped the, this being used as the theme song for that helped propel sales of this album. That's right. I've been looking for that TV show for quite a long time. I think there might be a few episodes now out floating around, but I did read that most of them were destroyed, which is a bummer. Yeah, that's that could be the problem with those TV shows from prior to people having VCRs to record stuff on. Networks just sometimes lost episodes or recorded yeah, or over them. Yeah, they recorded over them. They just didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, so yes, you're. That's right. That's how they achieved. I mean, I don't think that they. It, maybe you know. I don't know how much they reached anywhere else besides the UK. This sold pretty well in the US. Oh, really? Yeah, this one did sell pretty okay. well in the US as well. But yeah, I, th- I think those were their two primary markets that they that they hit. Cool. Now, t- now Taylor, you a-, a while ago, you have told me that uh, you would rank this among your favorite albums. Yeah, I mean, as far as albums I've listened to the most times, this is definitely up there. Not to put you on the spot, but could you ballpark how many copies of this album have passed through your collection at one time or another? I would say like five to seven. I've definitely given some away because, you know, it's such a good record, I think. And you come across it surprisingly a lot. At least I do out here. And my copy came from California. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think they hit they hit the West Coast particularly hard. Apparently. But yeah, I don't think I'm going to give away any more copies, though, because so I'm sure you guys all know who Norma Tanega is. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you also know how expensive. (laughs) I'm sure you probably also know how expensive that record is. It's so expensive. Well, at one point I had three copies of that and I gave two away and I had found all of them at a thrift store. And yeah. now I'm regretting that. <laughs> yeah, that fetches a pretty, pretty penny. I was just the other yeah. day, like, I actually, strangely enough, just the other day, I was thinking, I'd love to have a copy of that. How much does it go for? And yeah, it, we're talking potentially three figures. It's outrageous. Oh, three figures um, minimum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had three copies of that at one point, and I gave two of them away. So I hope those people are happy. Um, <laughs> well. Who knows, this might be one of them after this episode airs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't I'm not gonna give any more copies of this away. So but maybe I'll leave some to you guys in my will. Ooh. <laughs> now we just have to out. I'm leaving them all to I'm leaving them all to Jeremy, actually. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> wow, I can't wait um, for that day when I'm like seventy eight or some shit and like And I'm dead and And yeah. you're dead. And <laughs> a delivery van drops off like ten huge boxes and they're all pentangle. Uh, they're gold records. <laughs> Just basket of light. Just basket of light that Taylor's been hoovering up for years. Yeah. It's something to look forward to. Yeah, it's a good record. So do you celebrate any of their other catalog? Mm, I like their first one a lot, which is just their self-titled record. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that one super often, but that one's really good. I don't know if I know Sweet, like their second album. Mm -hmm. The the one that's like part live, part studio. Yeah. And then I think they have maybe two more. Yeah, I have a copy of Cruel Sister. Of all people, Jeremy, I think it was Jeremy or Sean pointed it out to me when we were record digging one time. (laughs) They're like, hey, Peter, there's a pentangle over here. (laughs) (laughs) We sure don't want it. (laughs) So, I mean, that's I just get into music that these two guys don't like so that they don't grab stuff up when we go digging together. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's my strategy. But I I am curious, like, uh, Sean, do you have any background with this group? I mean, I generally... I'm not a Ren Faire music guy, as we've established. It's not something that I hate maybe as much as Jeremy, 
but I haven't really sought it out, and I just knew that Pentangle was one of those groups, so I just don't think I've ever really taken a chance on them. So I was very pleasantly surprised when I started listening to this album earlier today. It, it's like, yeah, it's, it's a lot more psychedelic, and it grooves a lot harder than I was expecting. Like you were saying, they stand out from other bands that were kind of mining this UK traditional folk stuff. And I really like this album. I'm looking forward to getting to know it more. Oh, nice. Jeremy, how about you? Did you spend any time with us in advance of recording this episode? Any time with what? (laughs) The album that we're talking about. (laughs) Oh, sorry. I fully disassociated. I did give it a listen. I mean, there's a couple songs that I would intentionally listen to, but there are definitely some ones that I would be like, Reaching for that skip button very mm-hmm. quickly. Well, I would think you know, one of the members of this group being the great Burt Janch. I, that I, floored me. <laughs> I like some Burt Janch. Yeah, I would think that he would be one of your guys. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, how was he in this band? Yeah, we, we'll get into that. We'll, we'll talk about why that happened. But yeah, I would think that that would at least be an, a, a point of intrigue for you. It did intrigue me. And this was more than I thought it would be, as was pointed out. It's got some jazz elements and some psyche things and a few, there's like a few like kind of blues moments in it. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Totally. Kind of took me aback. I didn't anticipate that happening. So there's stuff going on here. But yeah, the the things I don't like are so grating to me that it's hard for me to <laughs> see past those. Yeah, keep on board. <laughs> Well, I've, yeah, as I kind of mentioned, uh, just in learning a lot more about these uh, UK folk bands after I got into things like Fairport Convention and Steel Eye Span 10 or 15 years ago, this was just uh, another album that somehow or other came on my radar. And uh, I think for a long time, this was the only one I I knew. And I'm not even sure that I initially grasped that Burt Jansch was in this band uh, and was kind of surprised when I put that together. But Taylor, how about you as the as the one who has owned many copies? How did you get into this? Um, well, I mean, similar to you, I mean, I guess it would probably be the mid 2000s. I'm sure everybody here is old enough to remember like freak folk and stuff, you know? Oh, Jeremy remembers that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that whole thing that was happening then, like Joanna Newsom, Devendra, Banhart, Vetiver. Espers. I mean, I was kind of into all that kind of stuff back then as a college radio DJ. Those records were coming out. I was playing them a lot. And then I think because of those records, there was sort of like a renewed interest in sort of the origins, which are, you know, psych folk and psych rock. And there were a couple comps that came out during that time. There's like two of them called Focus, not a four-letter word. They're full of British like acid folk and psych folk and stuff and um i was just really into all that stuff and couldn't get enough of it and we'll go down like rabbit trail you know wormholes and rabbit trails to get to more and uh i think i just yeah that's just this album was one of those that came up during that time and i really loved it yeah we'll we'll talk more about their influences and, and why exactly they they sound the way they do how they found this very unique combination of uh, musical influences but before we get into their story how about we play another song okay everyone game <laughs> <laughs> let's do it well we've we've mentioned him a, a few times so how about we we listen to the lead vocals of Bert Janch for our next selection his song springtime promises which is side a track three <laughs> Summer time is with us once again Flowers bloom and everywhere again And the cold days of winter are behind us now And the springtime promises all come true 
Long grass and bushes green again The sky's so blue I don't remember where The cold days of winter took the sun away But the springtime promises all came true It's summertime now so please don't throw it away Winter will be with us once again Flowers dying everywhere again And the warm days of summer will be far behind And the springtime promises soon forgot Bushes are withered and the trees are bare Dark and cloudy skies and people in despair And the warm days of summer seem so far away And the springtime promises still Again, these songs just groove in a very unexpected way. It's a kind of gentle, pretty folk song that I feel like almost anyone else would have executed in like a more traditional folk way kind of thing. But it, like, it's just grooving so hard behind the vocals and everything. It's great. And the guitar playing for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the vocals are not like deadpan, but they're not, you know, they're not overly uh, flashy or emotive. It's such an interesting vibe. Yeah. Yeah, he, if you watch Bert Janch perform that, and there's some great footage of them performing several songs from this album, or circa the early 1970s, available on YouTube. Most of the group are, are sitting when they perform, and he, he looks fairly unkempt, and he, it's it kind of is almost like a, a Jeff Tweedy from Wilco vibe, where you, where you see him and his hair is kind of like he hasn't ever brushed it, and yeah, cigarette hanging out of his mouth, cigarette hanging yeah. out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's so cool. Couldn't be bothered with really being on stage, but is going to sing the song for you regardless. That's mm-hmm. the, the original slacker rock before <laughs> pavement. Cool guy, yeah. Yeah, his voice has that too. It's really like round, you know, and uh, kind of relaxed, just his phrasing. He's kind of where I was going to start with the bio on the band. Do we want to get into that? Let's do it. So the Scottish-born Bert Janch was a leading figure in the British folk revival of the 1960s. He had started in the Edinburgh scene, where he shared a flat with fellow Scottish musician Robin Williamson, Bert Janch was engaged to a young woman named Christina McKechnie, or as we might know her, <laughs> Licorice McKechnie, from the, oh, of course, an uh, incredible string band. Yeah, yeah. Bert broke that off, and uh, Robin Williamson and Licorice McKechnie would go on to date and perform together in the incredible string band previously featured on I'd buy that for a dollar. By me. By Jeremy. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm still wondering if you, you did that just to pull it out underneath me. We'll never know. <laughs> you were a mystery wrapped in an enigma. So Jansch moved to London and began performing at local clubs. He met a recording engineer named Bill Leader, who made a home recording of Jansch playing on a reel-to-reel player, and that was sold to the Transatlantic label for a hundred pounds 100 pounds of what 100 p- <laughs> pentangle <laughs> <laughs> Bert's style was heavily influenced by the finger style and alternate tunings of guitarist Davy Graham and Bert's early solo albums starting with the self-titled in 1965 had in turn been hugely influential on the acoustic guitar playing of musicians like Neil Young who actually called Janch the Jimi Hendrix of the acoustic guitar, Paul Simon, Donovan, Nick Drake, Mike Oldfield, and Jimmy Page. They all cite him as a major influence, especially Jimmy Page. He was obsessed with Janch, and he he would go as far as to rework some of Janch's acoustic pieces into Led Zeppelin recordings without crediting 
Janch, can you believe? As you get, is want to do. Yeah. Can you I was going to say, was that the only time that <laughs> happened? Or, yeah. uh, <laughs> Very isolated. Yeah. <laughs> and Janch never pursued legal action, but said whenever the two of them were in each other's company, Paige could never look him in the eye. And he always saw that as a, a sign of guilt. Yeah, I was hoping that that story was leading to like a bar brawl <laughs> between the two of them. But okay, just... No eye contact. Yeah, the Pentangle were partiers, <laughs> so it, it, it could have led to that. Uh, Bert was seemed in it for the beer, the free beer, more than anything else. That's pretty much a quote that I read. Janch wasn't a traditionalist when it came to folk. He worked a lot of jazz and blues in his playing and was not averse to rock music, unlike much of the, the folkies of the time. And according to Bert Janch, he would get booed or thrown out of folk clubs for not adhering to folk traditions. So meanwhile, the London-born guitarist John Renborn also loved this band, The Pentangle. We haven't mentioned him yet, but he was more of a traditionalist. Although his experimentation tended to involve working medieval and classical influences into his compositions. I see Jeremy's ready to put all the blame on him. (laughs) He's coming up to the mic. (laughs) Biting my tongue. (laughs) John Renborn met Janch when the two would frequent the popular London folk club Les Cousins, or The Cousins, they seem to call it often. I think that Les is French for the. (laughs) And eventually they began performing together in a duet style known as Folk Baroque. In 1966, they released an album called Bert and John on the Transatlantic label. The two shared a house at St. Edmund's Terrace in St. John's Wood, London. And they were becoming quite a draw both as solo artists and as a duo. Also, meanwhile, the South London-born Jackie McChee had been singing as a soloist in British folk clubs since 1960. And in the mid-1960s, she met Bert Jansch and John Redborn and began working with the latter, singing on his albums and performing with him at The Cousins, starting around 1966. The emergence of the Pentangle as a proper group coincided with the opening of a new nightclub at the Horseshoe Hotel in London. The club organizer had entered a business arrangement with Bert Janch and intended this as an opportunity to create a platform for Janch as a solo performer, But Janch had seen the unwanted attention and screaming teenager fanaticism other popular folk musicians like Bob Dylan and Donovan had endured as their popularity rose and against the wishes of both the club organizer and his label Transatlantic decided to focus on being part of a folk supergroup rather than be the focus. Through John Renborn, the trio of folk musicians brought on drummer Terry Cox and double bassist Danny Thompson to fill out the lineup as they started gigging weekly at the Horseshoe. Now, both of them came from a jazz background. No surprise, Mm -hmm. based on the the rhythm section on this album. They had worked with the UK blues artists like Duffy Power and Alexis Corner and had performed in groups with a young John McLaughlin, pre-Mahavishnu Orchestra, and Miles Davis. John Renborn suggested the group's name, inspired by the Arthurian tale of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, the pentangle was a sign on the inside of Arthur's shield. It was definitely that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I can't deny it. Yeah. Jackie McShee said she mostly listened to jazz. The vocal, you know, the, the vocalist we've, we've heard. Hmm. So I think that all of that, all of that that you're probably not liking about this, Jeremy, can be put on John Renborn. So go, right. listen, go listen to those Burt Janch records. <laughs> Will do. As I mentioned before, they tended to sit on stage. Jackie tried standing at an early gig, and her nerves led her knees to shake, and she couldn't keep her legs still, and she decided to sit from then on. Everyone except Danny Thompson, if you watch most performances, Danny Thompson on bass, he's standing, but everyone else tends to be seated. They actually started with more of a blues sound in their early gigs, But as they came together, this folk jazz style, this hybrid, started to develop. Both the public and even management had a hard time coming around to what they were doing. American entrepreneur Joe Lustig, he had been instrumental in bringing American singer Julie Felix to prominence in the UK. 
He came into the fold as their manager and initially wanted to replace Jackie with Sandy Denny, who would soon go on to sing with Fairport Convention. He felt that Denny had more stage presence and had a stronger voice than McShee, but the other members held their ground. And on their first British tour, they were billed as Burt Jansch and the Pentangles. <laughs> Obviously, management were trying to go off of his popularity. But under Lustig's management, the band quickly went from a cult act to a major concert attraction. By 1968, they had outgrown the horseshoe and were out on the road constantly. Jansch and Renborn officially put their solo careers on hold. Pentangle signed as a band to Transatlantic, and they recorded their debut with producer Shell Talmy, who was known then for producing loud British invasion bands like The Who and The Kinks. He basically pulled a full reverse, and the debut was recorded entirely acoustically, actually as was this album, their third album. So there were some instances of the Pentangle performing these. They obviously reworked a lot of traditional material, but they also sometimes reworked more contemporary songs. And next we were going to feature their version of the Jeanette's Sally Go Round the Roses, which features lead vocals from John Renborn as well as Jackie McShee. So this is side B, track two, Sally Go Round the Roses. Don't you go downtown Sally, don't you go Don't you go downtown Saddest thing in the whole wide world Is to see your baby with another girl Sally, go round Sally, baby, go Yeah, so that song was originally by a girl group called the Jaynets, and I think it's a really interesting choice of a cover for them. Yeah, it shows that they weren't averse to contemporary music either. They had recorded a Staple Singers song on their first album. Oh, wow. I don't know if I knew that. Yeah. Which one was it? It was Hear My Call on that first album. It was a Staple Singers song. Wow. Uh, I really love the original Jaynets version. It's such a cool song choice, like Taylor said. Uh, I actually sampled the original song on one of the tracks from my Hard Friends DJ Hard Bargain album I put out a little while ago, featuring noise artist Bridget Bardont. <laughs> oh, that uh, Bridget Bardont was that track. Didn't that also feature yeah. all three of us on that album? It did. The, the I'd Buy That Crew was... <laughs> Did a track you guys on did there. some verses. <laughs> <laughs> we did an instrumental. <laughs> I only used YouTube clips for my instruments. I didn't play anything real. Oh, you contributed to that track? Yeah. I was 
I was wondering, I was like, man, Jeremy's really uh, upped his like piano skills <laughs> 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 or whatever you've, yeah, that was a fun project though. Check that out if you haven't listeners, the Hard Friends release by DJ Hard Bargain. Yeah, I really like the lyrics of that song. They're really cryptic and kind of spooky. Yeah, yeah, that definitely set the original apart at, at its time in the early 1960s. It makes sense in a way that it sort of almost has like a, a folkloric quality to the original lyrics. Totally. <laughs> that they would latch on to that, of all pop songs, that they would latch on to that one. The group split by 1973 through a combination of label and management drama, and I think just generally being burnt out. Janch and Renborn reestablished their solo careers, and Jackie McShee started a family. Danny Thompson did session work, which he he tended to do. He plays on Nick Drake albums. Uh, Terry Cox, he started managing a restaurant, the drummer Terry Cox. But I did, guys, find. Was it called Springtime Promises? <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, but it should have been. <laughs> I did find, guys, it's back, a Tupac connection. Oh, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> it's finally back, what the people have been asking for. How is Tupac related to Pentangle? Yeah. Okay. Terry Cox appeared on drums on Elton John's 1971 song, Indian Sunset, which was sampled in the posthumous Tupac track, Gospel Ghetto, in 2004, produced by Eminem. <laughs> Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Terry Cox also played on David Bowie's Space Oddity and the Bee Gees' Cucumber Castle. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. I also read that they were kind of had gone, called it quits after their last album in 1972. And I was kind of re reading the, the critics that so loved them before kind of turned on them. And I think kind of what happened is that they continued in this style of music and that it had kind of fallen out of vogue. And I think a lot of bands, especially British bands, kind of like took this kind of music and went pro uh, into prog rock. And then like they didn't. Yeah, which is, is funny because... In some ways, this album here, released in 1969, which is really the dawn of anything prog rock. Totally. It, it, it definitely has elements to it that could be considered prog rock, like the weird time signatures that we mentioned. Right. Speaking of prog rock adjacent, I saw that Danny Thompson's son was the drummer for Hawkwind for a few years. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> I hadn't gone that far. Thank you for that tidbit. Starting in the early 1980s, various lineups of original members began performing together again as the Pentangle. In 2008 and again in 2011, the original lineup, the lineup that we've got on here of Terry Cox, drums and percussion, Burt Janch, guitar, banjo, vocals, Jackie McShee, lead and backing vocals, John Renborn, guitar, sitar, lead and backing vocals, and Danny Thompson, double bass. That's the lineup. They got back together a few times, 2008 and 2011, but sadly, Burt Janch would pass away from throat cancer in October 2011, and John Renborn from a heart attack in March of 2015. So there will be no more original lineup reunions. However, Jackie McShee still tours a version of the band with new members. She's still out there representing the Pentangle, Jackie McShee's The Pentangle. And with that, we come to the end of their story. So let's say somebody wanted to torture me, Sean, <laughs> but they didn't want to do it with just Pentangle. How would you recommend they go about torturing me? Okay, well... I can think uh, of some medieval ways I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, okay. Well, uh, if you want like a, an in-depth torture with some context and discussion, I could recommend our episodes on Steel Eye Spans Below the Salt from 1972. With guest Stephen Krakow, a.k.a. Plastic Crime Wave. He's mm -hmm. kind of an expert in this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, 
I think he's someone that might have scoped me to the pentangle when I was really starting to show interest in this kind of music. Uh, a second recommendation, as we mentioned, the album that Jeremy mysteriously brought to the table for an episode, the incredible string band Liquid Acrobat as regards the air from 1971. You'll find no semblance of Ren Fair stuff on that. Well, not on the episode, because you said the one track that was too Ren Fair you wouldn't feature. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then one that is uh, maybe a little more different than the other ones, but this is an album that I picked up recently, have been uh, very interested in, and you know, maybe we'll feature it someday. Noel Harrison's The Great Electric Experiment is Over from 1969. I'm not familiar with that one. Noel Harrison, son of actor Rex Harrison, member of the 1952 and 1956 British Olympic skiing team and author of The Windmills of Your Mind. Yep. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, you tied it all back together. Oh, oh yeah. God. Tied it to oh, me. Yeah. Well, that, wow, that's... <laughs> is that everything, Sean? That's. I, I, have, I have one okay. more bonus. Jeremy said he wanted to be tortured, so I would highly recommend the 1971 psych folk masterpiece Isle of View by Jimmy Spheris. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God, always <laughs> with him. <laughs> <sighs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. A plus, Sean. Thank you. The band Trees is really good. I would recommend them along with those. The band Trees? Mm-hmm. Have you heard of them? And these are the trees that are not screaming? <laughs> yeah, not the screaming yeah, trees. Just trees as they are. I'll have to, I may have, I, yeah, I can't say offhand I know what that is. They may have been in a long list of stuff that uh, Krakow recommended to me at one point. I mean, if anybody reads his magazine, Galactic Zoo Dossier, it's just full of this stuff. Yeah. And you and I have both written for it. Yeah, we've both, uh, <laughs> we both worked on that magazine. I realized after we had been podcasting together for a while, I realized, hey, we've, we've previously semi-collaborated. On... <laughs> right, on the same issue, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, I think it was the 2015 or 2016 last one. <laughs> issue of Galactic Zoo Dossier, yeah. Well, Taylor, speaking of you doing things and the windmills of your mind, do you have anything you want to plug for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I think if your listeners like Pentangle, they'll like my show. I play music like that quite often and have played the Pentangle on it. Um, I will say that it used to be, my show used to fall um, every other Thursday from 12 p.m., 1 p.m. Pacific but now it's every other Wednesday as of last week. So it's in a new time slot. I was already thrown off by the days last week with, I think it was the holiday. And then mm -hmm. I saw that and I was so confused about what day it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that really, it's taking some adjusting. But uh, yeah, so it's in midweek now, not the end of the week. But then also going to tie it back to you guys I, I might have talked about it on the last episode i was on but uh there's a movie i music supervised called good one that is coming out in theaters in august i'm not sure how much of a reach or like how wide the release will be but if you have like an art house theater in where you live i'm sure it'll play there but uh yeah i'm really proud of it and I know that you guys did an episode on Kay Gardner's uh, Emerging. Um, yeah. I, I used one of her songs from her album, Moon Circles. Heck oh, yeah. nice. And a bunch of other really cool stuff. I, yeah, I got a copy of Moon Circles in Pittsburgh. It's an amazing album. Yeah, so I hope you guys will see that. It comes out on August 8th. Yeah, definitely. I'm so ready for good one. I know. I know. I post about it a lot. <laughs> it was just at can. Nice. So I had to post about that. Yeah. yeah. Peter and I will probably have to drive to a nearby bigger city to find a good art cinema. Spot. Yeah. Just, just come see it in Philly with me. And I'll be and I'll be sitting in the theater waiting to surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> DJ mahogany style. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Well. Thanks, Taylor, for uh, this is one that I've ever since I found out that you love this album, I've meant for you to 
come on and talk about it with us. And uh, yeah, it's, I don't really think there's, there's many albums I can think of that really, you know, as much as we have similar albums because they're of this period or kind of this general movement, this specific blend of, of sounds, uh, this album's pretty unique in that department. Definitely. And it is a still a thrift store gem. Yeah. Yeah. You're actually, you're better off buying this one. Don't buy this on the internet. You'll pay more for it than you will. If you just go out, you'll find a copy for five or less easy out in the world. (laughs) You'll probably pay 10 or more on the internet. So you'll find one. It sold really well in the United States. So it's got a very distinctive cover with the uh, the band seems to be performing at the top of a theater with the way it's formatted. <laughs> we were going to leave with the train song, lead vocals from Burt Janish and Jackie McShee. That blues influence is really strong here. Yeah, I think this one might have been my favorite out of the, the songs on here because of that. Yeah, yeah. This is specifically the one, the song I was thinking of when I thought, there might be some surprises for Jeremy on this album. <laughs> and so, yeah, and of course, it's uh, they, they say the liner notes are very helpful in that they do provide some context for the songs. And it says that this is a lament for the passing of the steam train. And it definitely feels like it's intended to replicate the, the rhythms of a locomotive. With that, we leave you with the Pentangle train song. From Basket of Light, 1969. Thank you for listening to I'd Buy That for a Dollar. Jeremy's dog can tell that we're... Jeremy's dog, Howie, can tell that we're about to finish up the episode. (laughs) He's eyeing me. He knows playtime is just around the corner. I'm Peter Cook. I'm owner of Jeremy's dog, Jeremy. (laughs) I'm Sean Hartman. I'm Taylor Rowley. That should always be your intro, Jeremy. (laughs) (laughs) Don't you understand?